America! My name is Irem Iose Frimpong, and you're watching The Black Athenians. Happy Friday. We're going to get right into it right now. We're with Mercer Baradaran. Uh, can I get two shots? And uh, we're going to talk about black banks, and we're going to talk about what black banks can do, and what they can do, and what we've been told they're supposed to do, but possibly can't do. So I'm going to say one sentence, and you're going to say the first thing that comes to my mind. Because the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Black people, we don't need the government. We have banks. We can just put, if we just control the black dollar and put our black dollar in black banks, we don't need any help from the government. We can lift our own community up. We don't need all those political riots, no more marching in the street, no more political organizing, that all is nonsense. We just need to control our dollar. And the first way to control your dollar is to put it in a black bank. And you say... Not quite. All right, so what's going on? <laughs> well, what, what do you mean? Yeah, we well, have dollars. Well, because the way anyone gains wealth is through government policy, right? And so to say that only one community is going to go without, and I understand the temptation because the government has not been a friend to black wealth accumulation. So I understand the temptation to say, forget them. We're going to do it ourselves. But that, that is just not how anyone else does it. And so it's just not going to work. That's not how anybody else does That's it. Not how anyone well, you know, else I've heard, <laughs> I've heard stories about immigrant communities. Just they, they control their money. Like everyone tells me about the Asians. The Asians control their money, and, and that's why they've succeeded in America. And and, and if we can, if the immigrants can do it, why can't black people? Because uh, the state has segregated and uh, constant segregated black populations for. Uh, hundreds of years. They've never done it with Asians or Italians or all these other pull yourself up by the bootstrap immigrants. And all these other immigrant groups, by the way, were able to do it. They were able to buy homes through these FHA financed uh, things. I, I, look, I'm not saying that other races and other immigrant groups have not been oppressed by the government. I mean, the Asians had their the internments and Native Americans have they got certainly yeah, yeah yeah Native Americans have I mean been you know decimated as as a people and so I'm, this is not about like who had it worse uh, kind of but as to wealth creation black communities have been sort of stopped at every avenue purposefully by state policy. And so this is not a oh they just haven't pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. I mean I've been studying the two century pulling up by the bootstraps. I've been studying black entrepreneurs and black bankers who for two centuries have been putting in the work of wealth accumulation. So that that's just a myth that these black communities you know are waiting for the government. I don't know if any, anyone's saying that, but it's just not true. Okay. So um, let's say I know how bank works. Yeah, I know how banks work. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm a good little Negro. I'm gonna go in, under my bed, pick out my King James Bible, and in my King James Bible, I'm gonna get all my money. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna get my 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 out of my Bible. My 70 was about 80 dollars, and I'm gonna give it to the bank. And I know how this works, right? This is the black community. We need a lot, so we have bigger. Uh, black commercial banking, black homeowner banking. I give this to you. This is the white community or the non-black community, mm -hmm. uh, commercial and home buying. And you're going to just put it, I'm going to give it to you. You're going to multiply this money and put it into our houses and our businesses. That way we'll get business and commercial loans and we'll be able to uh, get housing easier. So I'm going to give you my my money that I took out of my Bible. Mm -hmm. Wait, am I a black bank or white bank? You're a black bank. You're a black bank. Because okay. I, I give to black banks because yes. I know right. black banks yes. will give it to right. the black community because okay. that's how this works. Okay. I, will I might need a little bit of this back in a okay. few weeks. Take your money. Uh, and what, what banks do is they do fractional reserve lending. So I'm going to keep whatever the government requires. So 10% of that money at any counter. How much do you say? Uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. So let's say it's $100. I'm going to keep $10 just as reserves in the bank books. And then I'm going to lend $90 because this is how I make a profit. I make a profit when I lend the money to a borrower who's going to pay me interest. So this is my asset now, this money that I'm going to lend. This, I don't, I don't like that I'm keeping these deposits. And the liability, him giving me that money, that's a loan to me. And so that's a liability. I don't love that. Um, so I'm going to lend this now to someone else. Let's say a black borrower. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to lend it to a ahead. black borrower. Good. Okay. This is commercial. This is how housing. Which one okay. do you want to do? Well, this black borrower wants a house, right? All right so, so I'm going to, okay, but but they don't get to keep it. They have to 
buy from someone. Yeah, okay. So, okay. yeah, all right. So, I'm going to hold it just for a little bit. You're going to hold it, and then you're going to buy a house. I'm going to buy a house. Honestly, the person I'm buying for my house is a white person. Is a white person. Historically, we don't have land. Percent. Okay, so then, look, can I, I'll be the white person. You're going to be the white Yeah, you're going to give me this $90. I got to I'm hold gonna, it for a little I'm bit. I'm going to go deposit it into like my bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to deposit it into my bank, and it's not going to be that same blank, black bank. So this ninety dollars has now left the black community. But I, that's my Bible money. Yeah, and you have it. You still have your deposit slip. It's just that the money's creating wealth elsewhere now, because that's the money multiplier. <laughs> that's not why I gave right, it to a black bank. But that's not how banks work, oh. right? Banks don't keep the money. If if I kept the money, it wouldn't make me profits. It wouldn't make you profits. That's you right. want me to lend, but the only way ba ba blacks or any bank creates wealth is by lending the money over and over again. It's called the money multiplier effect. Because right. Alexander Hamilton says. Gold and silver acquire life in a bank. And the way they acquire life, the way they multiply, is through the lending, okay? But if black banks are gonna control it and multiply the money, they have to be all black banks and all community control. And you can't segregate money. But you can segregate people, you just can't segregate their money. We're gonna talk about this in a little bit. So now, you're a white person who you know donated to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is going to multiply that money in non-black communities. Sure. So yeah. and that's it started just primitive. Out. And right. that's just primitive banking. I mean, right. these days we've got um, most of the money doesn't actually come from deposits. It comes from the Federal Reserve, right. um, reserve scenarios. And, and we could go talk about it in complex ways. But basically, there are you know this apparatus of credit that is funneled by the federal government to the banks, and the money is basically a policy decision. How much money supply there is isn't based on how many total deposits people put in banks. It's based on how much the Federal Reserve decides uh, liquidity-wise we want in the in the coffers of uh, banks. So okay. that's more that complex, sense. but it's not coming from black wealth. And it's not going to create, it's not going to multiply. Not, not exactly. Not, no. Because no. so, you can't segregate money. Can't so segregate. somehow I can put my money in a black bank, but yet it'll still somehow, because of government policies, end up multiplying mm -hmm. in a non-black community. Because of government policies and because of the way banks work. And because that's just, yeah, what, that's that's just, just the how... logic of banks. Yes. All right. So, um, first of all, Mercer Broderant just came out with a wonderful book called The Color of Money. Uh, you can put up the graphic. It's uh, called The Color of Money, and uh, it ain't black. So, <laughs> but why isn't it black? We're going to go into that uh, a little bit. I want to say your first things. First things first, we have a studio audience here. Yay, clap for the people. Yay. We have a studio audience, uh, the Black Athenians. And uh, if you have any questions, people ask, what's Army doing with this program? The goal of this program is to do one thing. I want to create a black middle class in Athens. I want to say this one more time. I want to create a black middle class in Athens. Not like an exceptional black family, a black middle class with whole neighborhoods where everyone's doing just fine. And so this is uh, the fourth, count them, the fourth show in that vein. And we're going to talk about the promise of black banks, what they can do and what they can't do. We just saw a scenario where I gave my money, you know, from the King James Bible. That's where it belongs um, to a black bank thinking that it was going to multiply in the black community. And somehow, would you believe that it found its way out consistently? And she I just finished this book. I just finished this book. And it is a wonderful book. When I say it is a wonderful book, I say this book is probably more important than, uh, I, think, I think it's more important than the new Jim Crow. And uh, Michelle Alexander sold a lot of books. So all those people at home, could you give me the two shot? Yeah, all those people at home who are buying uh, who bought the new Jim Crow, need to go out and get The Color of Wealth. The Color of Money. The Color of Money, yeah. the color of money by Mercer Baradaran. She's a uh, professor at UGA, and we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it because, and I think this is very important, and I didn't actually figure out until like I read the book, and I thought, and I slept, and I saw you speak yesterday, and then I thought, and I slept. The legacy of the failure to make the black community whole in the United States is that we've segregated risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've segregated risk, right? And, and um, I think the, the, probably the, the most like, physical, material meta metaphor of the way we've segregated risk probably isn't even, is, is a wall, but not the wall you're thinking of, not Trump's wall. We're talking about a different wall that erupted in St. Louis mm -hmm. to, for the specific 
reason to segregate a risk. Because when we wanted to integrate risks and integrate like, all right, we have a justice claim. We need to make the black community whole. We need to have a justice claim. And um, in order to make good on that justice claim, we needed to share our fate and mix our fate with the black community. But if we keep the housing market segregated, if we keep the employment market segregated, if, if we keep the um, education market segregated, if we keep all of those markets segregated, what we've done is taken the most vulnerable, volatile population who've, whom we've starved and warehoused them in one place and ignored our political responsibility to them. And, and, and now that's affected credit markets, right? So when I say we've segregated risk um, with concentrating black poverty in one hand and, and that we all should share as we're all Americans, but instead we've segregated that risk to the black community, driving up that risk for the black community and driving down that risk artificially for the white community because as we're all American, it's, our, our, it's all our risk um, because it all emerges from our legacy of black exploitation. But instead, we've segregated this risk. So what does that mean to segregate risk? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great insight. And I think, it, you know, it comes down to there's physical segregation, right? Yeah. So as, um, you know, the northern migration, even in the south, we have physically walled off black populations. And part of that is, I mean, it started out not because they were, you know, concentrated poverty or crime. They're, right. they're really, you know, there's this myth that black black communities have always been ridden with crime. That, that is just false, they, they haven't been, you know? And to the extent that there was crime and there was certainly in cities, you know, crime, there's crime in every community, it was sort of egalitarian, all sorts of crime. But um, once we segregated these communities, then that created a cycle of concentrated poverty. And then federal policy sort of lays over that a credit structure where the government starts to subsidize credit risk. After the New Deal, the government comes up, so there's all of these mortgage foreclosures beforehand, right? So everyone is losing their homes. FDR comes in to restore sanity. We need, you know, when, when he talks about the, the worst thing to um, is fear itself, right? Yeah. He's talking about banking panics, right? It's all, I mean, the way I view American history, it's all through banking. So, you know, you have to excuse the, <laughs> but but it really is um, quite important. Um, so, he, so he says, you know, there's this fear and panic running through the system. And so how FDR bolsters this is that he creates these federal infrastructures, these insurance funds, huge capital structures, money created by the federal government to under gird this mortgage market, right? So the HOLC and the FHA and the Farm Labor Loan Association, all of the alphabet soup, a lot of this is just capital funds saying, look, private capital come in and lend mortgages, and if you default, if someone defaults, we will protect it. Okay, so what that does is it diminishes, I mean, completely eradicates the risk of lending. Not only that, but we also create an FDIC insurance fund to insure all of these deposits that banks are holding. So that brings in deposits into the banking industry and it makes banks essentially, you know, just they're printing money, right? They're taking deposits risk-free, they're lending risk-free, and it, so it, the capital is um, coming into this, you know, sector, you know, tenfold, then a thousandfold, and individual families who are getting these loans are growing wealth because they now have homes that are appreciating value, they can pass down to their children, they're getting student loans undergirded by this market. So this market is a huge boon to every American and to the economy. Um, and of course, the way that the FHA categorizes risk is by race. And that was not by credit worthiness, not by job or income. It is who lives in the neighborhood and what color are they? And really, it was black and non-black, because at that point, Italians and Irish and all of these other immigrant groups who were non-white before become white by nature of the New Deal, right? So the FHA deems certain races um, creditworthy and certain races not creditworthy, and it deemed black communities absolutely, totally risky. And so mortgage credit isn't going into these communities. And by the way, blacks can't leave the communities because the white communities don't want black neighbors. Why? Not just because they're racist, but they are. Also because they don't want their property values to diminish. As soon as blacks come into their neighborhood, then they are deemed riskier, and so they lose their mortgage um, uh, insurance. And so there's all of these, you know, there's racial covenants, there are, there's violence. This is why black um, homes are bombed. I mean, yes, 
right? This is racism, but it's also economic interest, right? We want to keep our home values. This is the reason today why people don't want black neighbors. I mean, to be honest, I think that, you know, this, this cordoning off of schools and risk is very much about this maintaining property values, right? Property owners have often been the policymakers in the country. So you've got this risk um, pooled into these black communities. They can't leave. Nobody else wants to come in. So you've got communities of renters and high risk credit borrowers. And so, and credit becomes money, right? We don't have gold and silver anymore. It's credit. And so our credit score determines our wealth and our ability to accumulate wealth. And so what's happening now is we've got two, two credit markets and I call it sort of a Jim Crow credit market, right? You've got white credit, you've got credit cards, you've got um, mortgage, uh, really cheap mortgages. And in the ghetto, you've got installment credit, which is very, very um, expensive. Now you have payday lending um, and you know check cashing and all of that stuff and then you had subprime lending afterwards but you've got very high risk credit and it's not that there are these like exploiters, these villains, these like sharks coming in the ghetto it's also because it just it's more expensive to lend when no one is insuring your risk and so um, so so you've got two different credit markets and that bubbles over and so the early civil rights movement in the north when we talk about the Montgomery bus boycott in the south a lot as sparking the civil rights movement but even before that in Harlem there was a lot of consumer leagues money right actually like we are sick of these lenders um, you know uh, in our communities exploiting us and so there's a lot of boycotts before Martin Luther King's boycotts in the South, boycotts of these northern business establishments, they're exploiting us, they're not hiring us, they're not um, giving fair credit. So this, you know, this conversation I think is one that was diluted in the um, civil rights era. So when we talk about civil rights, we talk about it in southern Jim Crow, we don't talk about it in northern Jim Crow credit markets um, that were not as blatantly obvious. I mean, the South was, unfortunately, it was just like the, the Klan, I mean, the Klan was up North too, but the Klan and you've got the white only signs, but in the North, it was no, no better. Uh, we just didn't, don't talk about it the way that we do about the South. But you had racial covenants and you had a, a double, but tell me about, t talk to me about the St. Louis wall. Okay, so in, um, in community, sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's important. In communities that um, wanted mortgage credit, so there was a white community in St. Louis, and this is not just the only one, it's just the most egregious example. A white community in St. Louis wasn't getting mortgages because they're too close to the black community, so they built a concrete wall. It was like a five foot concrete wall to separate the white community from the black community, and so mortgages could flow into the white community. And that state sponsored. The FHA said, oh, I see the wall. Yes. Nice exactly. work. Now the white community gets uh, yeah. gets mortgages. I mean, that's creative. That is creative uh, thinking, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I need to. I, yeah. I need a physical sign. Yeah. yeah. Um, that yeah. shows that like yeah. we don't have black people here. Yeah. There's, there's you know this famous Del Mar divide in St. Louis too. I mean, there's one street, and above it, the properties are black, and they're like thirty thousand dollars, and then below it, there's like multi-million dollar properties, and it was really just this FHA created a demarcation, and it, it's remained. I mean, these red lines, if you look at these maps, they're largely intact with like a very very few exceptions. Maybe Harlem's getting gentrified. There's a couple other exceptions, but the black communities just pushed some other place. And so these uh, walls, once you know erected, basically stay intact. Okay, so the walls stay intact, and it's funny, because I, I hear a lot about black capitalism. We think, you know what? Well, look, Italians came over, they worked, they built, they also became white. <laughs> Jews came over, they worked, they built, mm -hmm. they also became white. Mm -hmm. um, Asians came over, they worked, they built, they didn't become white. Mm -hmm. However, they came with capital. They came with capital. And if, if not social capital. Post-68, post-65, yeah. I mean. Yeah. It's like, it's I mean, half. look at my family. I mean, oh. I'm an immigrant, right? right? I'm an immigrant. I came here when I was 10. I didn't learn any English. It's a very bootstrap story. We had no money. We came right. with zero dollars. We were refugees from a politically torn country. But my dad had training as a surgeon in Iran. <laughs> so after 15 years of living in poverty, and we did. We lived in poverty all of my life. Right my dad was able to recertify as a doctor. Not a surgeon, but another kind of doctor. And he did drive trucks, and my mom worked at the dry cleaners. So I have this story to tell of growing up poor, and I was until I went what? to college, but at one point my dad became a doctor because he had that training in the old country, you know? And, and your grandfather wasn't a sharecropper? No, my grandfather, yeah, we didn't, no, so I'm not on any divide of this. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying, yeah. that, like, my grandfather like this, there's a difference. No, there's yeah, my difference. grandfather was, you know, a tradesman on the Silk Road, literally on the Silk Road, right. poor farmers. I mean, my family was very poor in Iran, but my dad was able to get training 
through the government, right. right? The police, you know, he had to join the police in Iran, and the police let him take classes to be a doctor. So very That's much so government, yeah. but the Iranian government. Anyway, but so at one point, my dad was able to get money and and help me pay for school and pay for law school and all this stuff. And so, I, you know, I, yes, there was hard work, right? But we came with something. Right, we came with that uh, education uh, provided by a government that was not this one. But, right. but so I think you know everyone likes to think that they worked hard. But I've studied black bankers who also worked very, very hard. Black communities. Who, I mean, you're telling me that like hard labor in factories and in on the fields, like that's hard work. It's just that their money wasn't going to a mortgage. It right. was going for rent and for installment credit. I mean, you buy a TV and you're paying a hundred times more than someone in the suburbs buying a TV. So you're working just as hard, you're just not getting the return on your money. This is, this is actually interesting because, uh, once again, read the book. It's a fantastic book. And she, she details, and I want you to tell a little bit, just a little bit about how um, after slavery and after the, the Civil War, there was a choice. Not a choice, but a, a path. Black people could either be given land mm -hmm. or they could be given a savings account. And then with that savings account, buy their land if you just work hard and save. But, and then I need to talk about how saving is and how like money grows. But, uh, but yeah, so yeah. tell me about the choice. So the choice is, you know, during Reconstruction, Reconstruction was very much built on giving land. And that seemed fair to everybody. I mean, oh. these, for two centuries, we've been, you know, working this land and uh, it's been very productive and it's created generational wealth for the people who own the slaves. I mean, slaves were capital. They were collateral for future loans. So people traded slave bodies um, as you would today any asset that actually increases in value because slaves <laughs> reproduce, right? So we don't talk about that capitalism aspect, but there was very much double book entry accounting of human lives. Um, so they are um, released from bondage and um, there's two choices. We can give them the land, and that is very much what the reformers and the slaves wanted. I mean, the free, freedmen yeah. wanted, uh, of course, because the land would then allow you to take care of yourself, right? To grow subsist subsistence crop. And this is what was happening in Haiti. What Haiti, um, the free slaves in Haiti did is they took the land and they grew things that they could eat, right? Um, because that's what you do if you have land. And there is very much a correspondence among southern um, slave owners and in Liverpool, cotton traders, and in New York, cotton traders, who are saying, we cannot go the way of Santo Domingo. We cannot have black slaves in the South have their land and grow crops. Why? Because we need the cotton. Right. So they needed blacks to grow cotton, and you will not be induced to grow cotton if you own your own land. So they needed the blacks to be labor. And this was a very explicit conversation, right? People were saying the only thing that the you know a Negro is good for is to grow cotton, and we need them to do it because we've got exports. We've got a whole capital market that relies on our cotton production and had been, you know, there are you know, factories up north, there's a market that is, um, you know, capital market uh, out of Liverpool, and so we need to induce them to grow cotton. How do we do it? Sharecropping, right? So they can't own land, they're gonna rent it, and what that does is, you know, W. Du Bois calls it, cotton is the, um, is the, is the crop of poverty. Because once you start growing cotton, you're stuck in this debt trap. You pay for your cotton in the beginning of the cycle. By the end, you barely have enough to cover. You can't use your land for subsistence farming, right? So you're getting everything from the merchant. Like basically, it's the same slavery system. I mean, James Baldwin says it's like the North and the South made this deal. They delivered, the, they freed the slaves and delivered them back up to their masters. And essentially the, the, the economic relationship, sure you're free, but freedom meant you can't do any other thing but grow cotton. And these were legal codes. They were called freedom laws, ironically, right? It's kind of like the Dream Act and you know the, the Patriot Act, all these ways that, that we kind of lie about what it is. But the freedom law said you can't um, have any other job besides cotton growing. You can't be not working. You can't be like loitering, right? So all of these laws precluded blacks from having any other um, livelihood. And this is why in mass, once they're able to leave, they leave the South because the South is not real freedom. And there is one uh, sharecropper who says, if this is freedom, right, I'd love to know what slavery is, right? Because it's just like, this is not what freedom looks like. Um, so uh, so what, what they do in Reconstruction, so Johnson vetoes Reconstruction, um, Andrew Johnson, because the South is, is violently overthrowing it. That is what the Klan is doing. Um, it's very political. It's very um, specific. Um, any black Republican in the South is lynched. Uh, any white Republican is, you know, driven out of town. Black property owners are the targets of all sorts of violence. So, um, 
what what survives the Freedmen Bureau is the Freedmen Savings Bank. And so, you know, you've got these reformers who are good hearted. I mean, this is Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner who want equality, but they settle, you know, second place is we'll give you a bank. And what the bank is going to do is let you save your money. We can't give you land because that, you know, is a no go. Um, so we'll need give you cotton. this saving. Yeah, we need that cotton. We're going to give you the savings account and you're going to save your money and get land later. And so the propaganda regime for the bank is save your money, you'll get land. And so free slaves save their money, right? <laughs> All this hard earned money in the sharecropping system they put into the bank. And this is millions of dollars, right? They're saying, James Bible, you're giving me the money. And what this bank is to do is, it's basically, it's, it's modeled after a savings bank, not a commercial bank. And the difference is crucial because a savings bank is a big piggy bank. And a commercial bank is a money maker. A commercial bank lends. Remember how, remember I said lending is the way to create wealth. Savings is not really, I mean, your money's not growing if it's just sitting there. But I know, I've heard on many occasions that if black people just stop buying Jordans and stop, stop <laughs> taking care of their weaves and saved, mm -hmm. they would have as much money as you know, white people. I, white I would love someone to catalog, like, how many lattes and Jordans do you have to skip to create generational wealth? To make up for that, <laughs> to, to make, like, give me how many, and, and to make up for that FHA loan that went to your grandfather. Like, how many lattes do I have to skip, and what? how do the Jordans lead to that? Because I've never seen a rational economist actually put that number down. No, what I have seen is, and I was surprised, but not really, because I know black people, we <laughs> save just fine. Oh yeah, more actually, uh, relative to income, blacks save more of their income than whites do. Yeah, I mean, right? Like, I I'm not surprised right. because I, you know, I, I don't I, you. right? I don't think um, I, I don't. Uh, anyway, that's a different conversation. But this mm. money got stuck in the savings bank, right. uh, and it was very. Um, uh, big old pot of money. It was a big old pot of money that was quite enticing. Okay, and so you've got a shortage of capital during that era because there aren't big pools of money. And here we've got this amazing pool of money. This is $1.5 billion in today's money that's just sitting there, safeguarded, right? And the managers of the bank happen to be white. And um, there's like this board of white philanthropists like Daniel Webster and these other guys, but they're not interested. They're just kind of like they're, in, you know, whatever as, as puppets or not puppets, but like, um, you know, just their, their faces are on the, the, the thing. And so um, the actual president is this guy, Henry Cook. His cousin is Jay Cook. And what he does with that money is Jay Cook is speculating in railroad bonds. So he's like the, the investment banker, kind of wheeler and dealer of the day. And he thinks the railroad bonds are going to be very profitable, but they're very speculative. And speculative means highly risky, right? And no one's insuring this. This is a, like a bet. And he takes that money and bets it on the bonds, and then it's gone. Uh, half of it. <gasps> gone. And um, these slaves, all my pennies. That's thought, a lot of pennies. That's a lot of pennies, and that was hard-earned pennies. And and the thing is that the, the the way that the bank was presented was that it was backed by the full faith and credit of the government because the bills of the bank had the capital on there. The bank was in Washington D.C. This was a bank created by Lincoln. It was it was uh, established by Congress, and so people thought, rightfully so, if that the, the government was going to back yeah. it. And it, it turned out it was not backed by anything. And so um, the money left, and it sows seeds of distrust, obviously. And you know, W.E. Du Bois says of the bank failure, he says, not even 10 additional years of slavery could have you know, sort of throttled the, 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 the thrift and the um, sort of good feelings of, uh, toward money than, than this failure of the bank. And, and you hear bankers in the 1960s, and like 100 years later, talking about this bank failure. No, honestly, yeah. the, 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 it's not a myth, because like I, I, I have family in South Carolina, in yeah. the King James Bible, it's because of the Freedmen's Bank. Yes, it's been like they yes. keep the money in the King James Bible under the bed because, like, in the memory yep. of the of the Freedmen's Bank, with and just disappeared. Yeah, I mean, and it reverberated. Yeah. yeah, and so it does two things. One is a distrust of government, a distrust of banking, but also the black community saying, "Forget the federal government. We need to do this ourselves." And so that's why I say I understand this idea. Like, the government has never worked for us. The government has never for the black community. Right? It's never worked for the black community's wealth creation, so forget the government. I don't right. trust the government. So, of the course you The problem is, and we need to drive this home, give me yeah. the camera right here. We need to drive this home. Banks don't work in America. I'll say this again. Banks <laughs> do not work in America without the government. Am I overstating the case? No, you're not, absolutely. <laughs> Banks do not work without the government. I mean, this is, it's a government bank, it's a government bank partnership. It has always been the case. Um, banks, 
so usually we think of businesses that are operated by the laws of supply and demand. If you think about money, the laws of supply and demand don't work with money because money is the sort of the way that the, the, the supply and demand are regulated and money stems from federal government policy, especially post sort of Lincoln having the greenbacks. Before that, you can say, well, bank notes are based on the individual bank. But before that, banking, U.S. banking was not a model of efficiency. Today, um, all of that money derives from federal government policy. I mean, you saw the bank bailout, right? We've got trillions of dollars, I mean, trillions, I don't think we can imagine what trillions, but lots of trillions of dollars went to undergird the banking system. Where did that money come from? The federal government just created it. Created. They created it on a balance sheet. That's how money is created. A lot of black people lost their houses in the market crash. You're telling me the federal government could have created money? Absolutely. 53% of the wealth was wiped out. And the federal government, 53% of the black wealth was oh. wiped out. Why? Because once we had those segregated pools of risk, the banks started going for risk. Okay, So the risk became profitable during the subprime, the lead up to the subprime crisis. And so where does Wall Street go when they need risk? They go to those communities. We know where they're going. So the subprime, so they found and the people, like, let's be clear, and the people in those communities are vulnerable and thirsty. Yes, because they've never had credit. <laughs> they've never. And so all of a sudden, the, the, the Wall Street demand comes and peddles these subprime loans. By the way, a lot of the subprime loans, the, the, the studies show that blacks and brown, black and brown people, um, actually it's, it's actually mixed at this point, right? Black and brown people who are qualified for, for prime, prime loans, loans get subprime loans at a much higher rate than white. So there was a, a targeting. And Wells Fargo, there's documents of them actually talking about these are ghetto loans, right? right. Um, so, so, so this is very much a, a purposeful thing. So yes, during the bailout, the government had two options. Um, and one was to, uh, uh, to rewrite these mortgage loans to save homeowners, not just black, everyone. All the homeowners who lost their homes to foreclosure, they could have undergirded these. That's what FDR does. Um, they choose instead to put the money in the banks, uh, to save the banks, thinking that you know, the logic goes that the banks will then lend. What do the banks do? What does Bank of America do a month ago? They closed down 2,000 branches. Where? In poor communities. The, communities. That money has never come back. They, they never rewrote those loans. They never rewrote those mortgages. That was the, the premise of the bailout. They never did that. And they're as profitable today as they ever were. Now, that's not a racial issue, but blacks suffer more. Right. Um, whenever there's a downturn, there's this old adage that when downtown, when Wall Street gets a cold, Harlem gets pneumonia. And it was the case with this crisis as well. When you're living on the margin, when you have poverty, all of the crises hit harder. Um, the same thing with the Great Depression you saw in black communities, it, it creates a systemic poverty. I mean, there's um, Gunnar Myrdal comes to America in 1944 to study the black situation in this, you know, um, it's called the American Dilemma. And his, his thing is the American Dilemma is the state of blacks in America, because we, we are premised on democracy. And what he sees in black poverty, this is post Great Depression, he's like, this is not democratic. Like the, the American democracy is a lie. Right? He calls it a dilemma. But he's saying that the that the um, the poverty is unequal. These black communities are, you know, there's places where they don't have sewage. Right? Most of the South is living. You know, they're getting into modernity. Black communities don't have running water. There's like cholera epidemics um, in the North as well. There's you know, there's like a whole um, uprising in Harlem because there's it's it's rat infested. Right? There's like tuberculosis is like you know seventy percent in Harlem versus you know ten percent in other places. These are diseases that the white communities had eradicated that are lingering for decades in the black community. All right. So, uh, so you talked about the, the depression, and I want to I want to dig deep in this because when FDR um, and the Southern Democrats decided to build white wealth, they wanted to build white wealth. Like, yes. like, well, FDR and the Southern Democrats decided together somehow that like we got serious. We want to build a white middle class, mm -hmm. and they did it. It yes. was successful. They built a white middle class. Yes. Now, when Nixon. Mm -hmm. Nixon, you know, 40, 50 years later, um, decides, you know what? I want to build successful black people. He wasn't looking at a successful class. Mm -hmm. He wanted success stories, yeah. right? So you yeah. have one president in Congress uh, that's committed to building a successful middle class, and you have another president who pushes black capitalism not to build a successful class, yeah. But, and this is documented, right? Yeah. Like, he wanted to build success stories yeah. 
the custodians can be used to yeah. kind of ameliorate the people. Yeah, so so let, let me go back to the New Deal because this is really important. Um, there's a couple of books here that I'll recommend. Uh, one is called When Affirmative Action Was White by Patrick Ira Nelson. Katz-Nelson. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. The other is Master of the Senate or the whole Robert Caro series on Johnson because he really goes through the, the how the Southern block of the Senate was able to block everything and was able to push everything. So the New Deal doesn't get passed without the Southern block. The Southern block isn't a majority, but by nature of seniority and their cohesion in protecting white supremacy, they are able to control the heads of each of the cabinets. So they're not able, they're not al- allowing any bill to get on the floor. It's not even like it's getting debated. Like the Southern heads of committees are not allowing civil rights bills, any bill that would make things better for blacks because again, they need blacks to be labor. So they're not allowing any of this stuff and this was purposeful. So FDR has two choices, right? Had it been, um, uh, what, what's her name? Oh my gosh. Um, his wife. Oh, Eleanor. Eleanor. No, she would have fought for us. Yeah, yeah. Eleanor would have fought. Yeah. Eleanor would have fought, and she was kind of, um, you know, heartsick by what her husband is doing. But her husband makes a deal with the devil, right? He either gets the New Deal, which is class based and it helps white America, or he goes for blacks. You cannot get both because the Southern Bloc will not let him do this. And so all of these New Deal um, reforms get passed with huge exceptions. Huh. That, you know, right, so in, in Katz Nelson's book, he's clear, like, look, the New Deal passes, but in terms of black labor, 75% of the workforce at the time was sharecroppers and domestic help. So they get cut out of unemployment. They get cut out. So the unions are able to, right, the unions are able to do collective action and collective bargaining, and blacks are left out of the, the ability to form in collective action. The unions won't take them. So there's all of these ways in which we think of the New Deal as this progressive era success and it was i mean this is the height of u.s progressive era and we were like close to being like a social dem- a socialist democracy mm-hmm. but it starts with wilson by the way right? right wilson is the first progressive another friend of the negro another i mean he is an, a stated white supremacist <laughs> um, um nixon I, I mean um wilson that's a freudian slip nixon wilson um wilson um screens birth of the nation in the white house right he segregates the federal um uh uh, right, right, infrastructure. So he he is a state white supremacist, and he also passes some great progressive legislation, all of which is anti-black, right. um, or at least leaves huge holes that blacks are. No, making. anti-black. And like, we just have to. We need a higher standard for what counts as progressive legislation. Like at the end yeah, of the day, it was like, progressive, but if you count if you count the people as not black, right? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it works for the people. You know, in the Federal uh, Reserve, Wilson creates the Federal Reserve, and it's very much a populist, you know, capitalist. Yeah, you know, it's great. Um, it helps everyone except black people. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's you know, yeah, that's fine, acceptable. Right, right. But um, but talk to me about but I mean, the, even but Bernie the Sanders. I'm yeah. sorry. This is don't want to be yeah. too political because it's recent, but oh, wow. you know, even Bernie Sanders gets pushed on reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates, and he says, oh, well, that, that's radical. Yeah. I mean, Bernie it won't Sanders, go, it won't, who is saying, yeah. I will break up the banks and I will you know, guaranteed education, who's saying some quite radical progressive stuff, says reparations, please. Yeah. No, that's a problem. That's a problem. It's because we haven't, I think, and we're going to end with that. Um, it, we don't do a good job teaching history. Like no, we, yeah. we no, don't no, 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 we do do a good job. Those who want to control the narrative do a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> we do do a good job. It's purposeful. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's like, like that. Uh, so there's a great book called How Propaganda Works. It's by Jason mm-hmm. Stanley. He's, about, he's a uh, philosophy prof at, at Yale. And he said, look, look, in an authoritative regime, an authoritarian regime, you have a minister of propaganda. They control the mm-hmm. television. They control press. They just tell you what to to think, and that's just what you're going to think because that's the only stream of information. Yeah. In a liberal democracy, we have to we have the same propaganda, except we're a little bit more crafty about it. We do it by omission. Yeah, we and do it by what we don't tell people. Right, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist because I don't actually think it's all of these like cynical people in the back room being like, "Oh, we're gonna." But I mean, there's some of that, but most of it, it is we are we have collective amnesia as Americans. We love strategic to be, though. We love to be optimistic about the past. We love to tell stories about our greatness and our egalitarianness, and so we have these myths. Um, there's a great new book by Kurt Anderson called Fantasyland, I and mean, he talks about like Disneyland and this fantasy world being very American, right? And so I think part of this is this like whitewashing our history and and the the projection of race. I mean, you have even during the Cold War in the 1950s, um, you have in the 19, but this is before civil rights, Jim Crow is at its height. The State Department is creating these pamphlets for the communists saying how great blacks are. And they're using black businessmen 
as propaganda. They're saying, look at this wealthy black businessman. Would I mean, uh, you What's know, would, would there be black wealth if we had a race problem? Please. And this is in 1950, <laughs> right? So, so, so I think we do this, and and I, and I think. Um, you know, and the way civil rights gets passed, right? The way that we are, our policymakers are convinced to pass civil rights is uh, because of the Cold War. Um, you know, there's uh, the communist regimes abroad are saying um, the capitalism is racist. Um, so, and look at you know they're using lynchings, they're using all of these atrocities in the South to as propaganda your, against yeah, yeah. Uh, the U.S. and the U.S. So you've got these memos um, going up to JFK and um, before to um, Eisenhower saying. This is a state, um, uh, what do you call it, a State Department national security issue, right? We are, um, this is a State Department issue. So these memos, these early civil rights memos come from the State Department as a strategic war initiative. Yeah. Um, so the way to pacify, so Nixon, the way to pacify. Oh, Nixon, yeah. Nixon, the way to pacify, how are you going to pacify the black community? They've been locked out. Um, from, to be clear, the FATA program that was so inter instrumental in building white wealth from uh, 35 to 68, 98% of the mortgages were white. Yeah, but that's not surprising because that was on purpose. That was I mean, on the, purpose. The pamphlet said these manuals, <laughs> FHA was saying. Don't safe. insure black. No, literally. Oh, yes. We will not. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, no, they said, like, uh, we're looking for racial homogeneity. Right? right, and homogeneity means white. Right. So they're like, we any neighborhoods that are uh, racially inharmonious are risky. Uh, this so is an economic decision, them. so we won't ensure them. We yeah, ensure them. yeah. So Nixon, I mean, so, so what's happening in the civil rights era? I, mean, I think, you know, uh, I think it's time to reevaluate what happened in the civil rights era between 1963, when you know Martin Luther King is bursting forth on the national scale, until 69, when, when it's all dead. It's essentially over. <laughs> Everyone's dead or out of office, and the Forward momentum has now got whiplash. It's backwards. That's what happens when a string of assassination kills your leader. Well, By the way, if anyone, give me the camera again. <laughs> this, is my, this is my life insurance policy right here. <laughs> if, any, if anything happens to me, because what I'm doing right here, I did not die by my own hand. I am healthy. I can run a marathon. I love my family. If anything happens to me or mine, I do not forgive anybody. <laughs> I do not forgive anybody. I want you to shut it down. It was a plot to get me because I wanted to build a black middle class in Athens. And like I said before, if you can build a black middle class in Athens, you can build it in Gainesville, you can build it in Mon um, uh, you can build it in Macon, you can build it in Columbia, you can build it in St. Louis, you can build it all across, you can build it anywhere. There's white money and poor black people, which is a lot of places in these United States. And if we can figure it out in Athens, we can figure it out in all of those places. But if anything happens to me because of uh, my naked politics, because we're doing politics here, we're doing black politics here, um, I like my life, I'm not depressed. <laughs> Um, I, my, my future is bright. I'm just trying to get a black middle class for my people. So, get them. If anything happens to me, get them. I'm not forget. I'm talking Molotov. Go, go, and start, not, start in five points. <laughs> start in five points. And then, like, work out in the suburbs. Um, so, like, and so, like, anybody who's thinking to take me out, you know, my people are coming for you first. Um, so, like, just don't take me out. And let us build a black middle class together. That's my little life insurance policy. I'm going to need a little legal defense fund. First of all, we have a huge... <laughs> Eventually, I will be sued. Um, like, uh, so, the show was growing. There were probably about 15 people. Uh, I don't know, two, four... I can't count. Um, anyway... I have more than that. We're in, the, we're in a smaller space than we need to be right now because we had a bigger space, but the person who owns a bigger space saw the show, thought it was a little bit too hot, might jeopardize his white check. And so we're in a smaller space right now. The smaller space uh, is too small for what we're growing. And we need to actually, I just need to buy a space. So eventually, I'm in, this is, I need $100,000 to just buy a studio in this neighborhood and so we can do the show and some other programming in this neighborhood, but it's not uh, dependent on nonprofit money or any, anything that asks me to be apolitical because I don't think there's an, apol there's an apolitical solution to our situation because unless we control the, politicals, um, uh, the political power, then we can't control or work with the banks to make sure the black community needs, through the banks, what it needs to grow into 
uh, the quality of middle class that we deserve. So if you support what I'm doing here, first of all, email this out to your friends. Email this, out, email this video out to your friends. Ask them to subscribe to the channel so that they know when every Friday at 4 o'clock we're going to be doing another show. Next week's show is going to be on the union movement in the South and why the racist use, uh, roots of the right to work legislation. Um, email it out to your friends. Your book club should first screen this video, then talk about it. Um, talk about the fact that like black banks can't do it because banks work within a political sphere and if you don't have control of the political sphere the money finds its way out of the black community with little money we have and just works with everybody else um, so we need political power and knowledge of how banks work and also if you're in a book club screen this video and then for your next book club you need to buy this book you need to buy this book the Color of Money by Mercer Baradaran. She's a, a you've law been professor. listening, what? Law professor. A law professor. Law professor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were looking for that, so. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, she's a law professor at UGA, at the University of Georgia, where I'm a PhD student. And uh, buy this book, discuss it for your next book club meeting, because it's a wonderful book, and it, it works on, it's, it shows how the segregated communities actually affected credit market, so we had a segregated credit market that disproportionately made black communities more volatile um, and disproportionately made white communities safer and more insulated than they deserve to be, uh, given the legacy of redress that needed to happen. So we need to integrate, we've always integrated our money, but now we need to integrate political power um, in order to make the nation whole. And our failure to make the nation whole is why we have so much black generational poverty today that cannot, and if you get anything from this, it cannot be um, uh, mediated by the black community alone. It needs to be a political solution to a political problem that was started by federal, state, and local governments, and it needs to be redressed by federal, state, and local governments. And that's what we're doing today. So we're gonna take questions for the audience. Matthew, if you could write the phone number down on a piece of paper so I can tell. I should have the phones working. We're gonna find out. Um, but first, audience, 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 audience. Um, if there are any questions, please. Uh, the microphone is right there. And uh, I want to hear what you have to say. So I guess my question uh, for the professor would be, where in our current climate do you even start with the change necessary to fix this problem? Thank you. Can you get the camera on her? I mean, I think um, uh, I, I go between being optimistic and pessimistic about what the current economic climate is going to do. So, so on the one hand, I think, um, look, the racial myth that Nixon crafted post-civil rights has fallen apart. And uh, it's sort of naked out there right now. I and mean, we have uh, you know, a, a president who peddles in white supremacy and uh, a resistance who is finally seeing that the Republican Party was built on that solid base. So I think that's good um, because I think uh, some um, on the fence Republicans had said before, well, for me, it's about you know taxes or economics, and it's not about the Southern strategy. It's not about race. Um, and now we're seeing, well, actually, the, the party really is about that. So, so I think that's good. Um, so first, you know, what to do. Um, <clears throat> I think get educated. I mean, really, like, I mean, maybe it's because I'm an educator and a reader, right? I'm a bookworm, but like, read, start reading and not start, but continue reading and understanding how these things work. Um, and uh, join coalitions, right? Um, not dividing ourselves up among uh, race. I, I think this is something that the left is doing a lot now is we're eating our own a lot. We're, we're sort of doing these litmus tests, if you don't believe this, then you can't be this. And, and this is a, a strategy that's been used through time, right? So this is the, the populist party in the South in, during Reconstruction tried to 
bring in sharecroppers and debt, you know, uh, workers of white and black together, and the white supremacists drove the wedge in between them. And that has lingered. I mean, there are poor people have more in common with each other than they have with the capitalists. And now there are more of us than there are them. I'm, I'm not, like, obviously I know I'm a privileged person, I'm not poor, but there are more common people who live on our income than those who live on their capital and are um, using their capital, not in a beneficial way. I mean, finance has gotten so out of control that it's just circulating money within itself. It's not actually going to the real economy anymore. So so I think there's more of us, and if we can join forces and understand, and, and I'm even talking about Trump voters, right? Um, I think there were a huge subset of Trump voters who heard Trump saying, I'm gonna drain the swamp, and I'm gonna um, fight the establishment, and, and, and they thought they meant like the big banks and the actual capital coins. So I, I want to take them at their word, and I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and say, you actually weren't voting white supremacy. Because I do believe that. I, I know I have friends who are Trump voters who were sick of it, and they saw Hillary Clinton, and they saw her speeches on Wall Street, and they thought, this is a man who, and I can't believe that they thought this. I mean, I cannot <laughs> believe that you could see Trump and think that he would do anything for anyone who was not himself. I mean, I honestly cannot believe that they thought that, but I, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt. And so this is the co these are the coalitions that we have to be willing to make. You know, even, and I get, you know, I think um, race and class are, are converge here in a lot of ways, but I think there is a class divide as well that we need to, because because these communities that are hoarding wealth are also hoarding it away from white rural right population. So so um, I think what we can do is to have conversations across the divide that deal with community collective action that are not, um, and I don't want to say like kumbaya, like don't be divisive, because sometimes you have to fight, but you know, it's like Martin Luther King, like come join us. Right? I mean, before his death, he was doing a poor people's march on Washington. And it was like, all the poor people, right? We're going to drive up mules from the south and from the north. We're going to bring people from the ghettos and the white rural people. I mean, it was very much a populist movement um, because he understood that there was more to this. It was, he, he called it the triple sort of sins of racism, um, militarism, and capitalism or something like that. I mean, not, not capitalism, but something essentially, you know, worse, um, but the, the same meaning. So, so I think... Um, you know, I, that's what I would like to see the progressive left do, is to have another Wilson, you know, FDR-type progressive movement, but this time with everybody, right? As it should have been the first time. I, I mean, it's a little bit more, I'm a little bit more of a pessimist for that, because I think, I think poor white people need money in order to exercise their racism. So, like, the first thing that, if you give poor white people money, the first thing they do is move to the suburbs. Because they've always yeah. wanted to be racist, yes. they just haven't had the money to do it, and now they can. Yeah. So, like, the idea that if you... But, 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 but what if there were no, what if there were integrated suburbs, I mean, uh, there, there was no suburb... They don't want that. Poor. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> like, they don't, like, they don't, like, I think whiteness, I think, I think pe white people pay for whiteness. Like, that's what they use their money for. Because whiteness has been profitable in the past. And I'm saying, let's make it not, not profitable. profitable. Yeah, voluntarily make not whiteness not profitable. Yes, because it so hasn't actually people. been for all. And this is this is the lie of whiteness, right? Like, it's going to be profitable for everybody. And so there's this, a, a huge gla class of white poor people who are saying, I'm just going to, it's like Chris Rock saying, there's not a one of you who would trade places with me. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of poor white people who are like, I'm just going to keep my whiteness. Yeah. And as long as I'm above, you know, the Mexicans and the Muslims and the blacks, then I'm good. And, and we need to, but they're not. It's a lie. They're not. But they feel like they are. They feel like they so are. So maybe they are. Maybe. Okay. I'm just saying, if you feel like you are and what you want is the feeling, then like. I mean, maybe we should, I mean, this is the, the, where the different conversation comes in, is mm. to have a unifier. And, you know, I talk about Barack Obama, and this is hard, right? And Barack Obama says there's no black America, there's no white America. And he was wrong. He was and wrong. he was dangerously wrong. Dangerously wrong. Okay. I think, well, yeah. look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've heard people wrong. say that. But, but also, Barack Obama, I say, I mean, he's unlike any black American. He grew up in a, in a white. Um, uh, with his white grandparents who had an FHA mortgage. I mean, he talks about his growing up, his grandfather went was to, a bank he was a GI grandma, yeah. bill. I mean, they were middle class, but he didn't grow up in like the lap of luxury. He did grow up, you know, m middle to lower middle class, but they had these FHA programs. So he, he certainly dealt with racism, you know, in his life, but he also had the privileges of white America. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, he's aware of them. Look, I, I, I like Barack Obama. Uh, I mean, uh, uh. 
Yeah. Um. <laughs> I think black wealth cratered under him. I think yeah. he could have done something to keep yes. black people in their homes. True. And I was like, no, I kind of, mm, I want these people to True. be my friends yeah. afterwards. So like, I think, I, I, think, I think he actually, when he said there is no black America, there is no white America, he actually, that was a, that was what he said to get elected and as a Faustian bargain. That's not much different than the one Roosevelt did. Like I think, I really do think it was, it confused a lot of black people on race. And the reason we can't have the race conversation we need to have is because black, um, because Barack Obama spent the last eight years yeah. confusing black people about what it meant to be black and confusing white people about what it meant to be black. See, this is why I need my own space so I can say these things. <laughs> I mean, I'm a softie on that. I, I generally think that there's good in people. Um, so I, I, I Give do that Obama take, clip. you know, we're gonna get, we're gonna, to, we're gonna, let, me, let me say, let me, the first time I met Obama was in 2005 before he was running for president. And I saw him on the stage with, in the Apollo in Harlem. I lived in Harlem for a decade. He came with Cornell West and Chris Rock and Barack Obama. And this is when Cornell West liked Barack Obama. And so he <laughs> was, um, the, he spoke very cogently on race. And I was convinced that he understood the complexity um, of, of the racial issue. And I guess I still give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> well, you know, one of us does. Um, <laughs> no, I think he understands it. I just, I, I think he was in it for Barack Obama. He yeah, got sure. what he needed. Sure, he got sure. what he needed out of the last eight years. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't think black communities got what they needed out of the last eight years. And I think that's a problem. And I don't think that's a problem he was ever serious about redressing. Or he would have redressed it. I or at least used that pulpit to talk about race I in a way to say that actually there is a black America. They're broke because yes. of the power hoarding and economic hoarding of white America. And like we need to make this situation whole. And the first thing... and. Marcus asked, and I think this is a very good question, what, what do we do first? We've got to fix education. Yeah. We've got to fix education. We may need to make a better quality of citizenry, and that's a white citizenry and a black citizenry. And, and, and I don't want to compare Barack Obama to Booker T. Washington, but let's just go there, because I think Booker T. Washington is a leader who is genuinely interested in the growth of his people, but he's also the leader that the white capitalists picked. picked and funded because he was able to talk in a way that they liked. And so there were other leaders. There was like, if you think about market competition of leaders, there were other black leaders who were either killed or silenced before they got to the national stage. And Booker T. Washington happened to be the, the one that got there. And so you can say that with Barack Obama too. Like he wasn't trying to exploit the black population. He, wasn't, he didn't have ill will, but he's the one that white America picked as the first black person. And now he's used as a success story. Mm -hmm. He's used as he's a... He's used as a way that racism is gone. Right. Look at Barack Obama. Yeah. Racism has gone. Look at Barack Obama. Forget the generational po uh, yeah. the poverty. The, 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 the wealth that cratered mm -hmm. in the last eight years. And, and Martin Luther King has been... His legacy has been revised in this way, too, because he said a lot of damning things about American culture. And the one thing that we remember him for is... Shall, you know, don't judge me by the, uh, you know, the yeah. dream that you don't judge me by the character of my, whatever, the color yeah, of my yeah. skin, which is like one line that was a throwaway line in an otherwise quite dramatic, I mean, he talks about like, we have gotten a check and it has insufficient funds, right? So he is talking about economic redress at that I have a dream speech. And then he goes on to make it much more safe. I mean, Hoover tracked him as a communist, like he was a dangerous man and he gets assassinated and then he becomes this whitewashed, oh, he just went love. And, and the way- oh, He wanted his check. The way King, for yeah, people. for the community. And yeah. the, the way that King is talked about now against the black community, I mean, you have Bill Clinton coming, uh, speaking to the black community in the 1990s and saying, Martin Luther King would be ashamed at the violence in this community. What would you think if Martin Luther King were to come out here and to see the black on black violence? I mean, he, he's, I've, I see it now where, where you know, people are saying, we want redress and reparations. Like Martin Luther King said, don't judge by the you know, skin color, and so therefore we don't see race anymore. But that's not what Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King talked about the FHA and the GI Bill. He says, we should have a GI Bill and a VA loan and FHA for black people. Right. Martin Luther King understood that. He was not Booker T. Washington. Right. Martin Luther King was not Barack Obama. Martin Luther King was quite radical. Right. Um, but not, we don't talk about the radical. I think that's, I think that's unfortunate. And uh, the idea that... But he was also, sorry, he was also genuinely nonviolent. Yes. Right. So I think, and his nonviolence was very strategic. It was like Gandhi. Gandhi was also not a, 
uh, weak. I mean, he wanted to take down the British Empire, but he understood that the way poor people can do it is through nonviolence. It was strategic. It was smart, and it was global. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, but just the idea that exceptional black people, you, the story of exceptional black people used against the quality of programs that will actually create a class, because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create a class. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, we like to tell stories about ourselves that highlight our own merit and our own hard work. I mean, if you were asked me, like, why are you a su the successful person you are, and I'm not, no one would ask me that. <laughs> but, like, why You're did you... You're successful. Yeah, so why, you know, and I would say, oh, well, successful. I worked hard, and I, you know, because I can remember all those times I worked really, really hard, and all those times where I hustled, and all those times where I could have been loafing, and I actually worked hard. So I'm likely to tell my story as I worked hard, and not every time I got pure lucky. Everything that was just easier for me because of who I was, you know. Um, so, well, you left undergrad with a ton of loans, right? No, because well, I I got a full ride scholarship to undergrad and to um, and to to law school. So it wasn't necessarily money, but it was social capital. It was, you know, being from a, a parents who pushed reading. And, and again, mm -hmm. like, you, th there's all of these ways that you the middle class sets up. And, and I, I do, I'm, I'm a little bit different because we weren't middle class, but my parents had a middle class upbringing. Yeah, I was a surgeon, ways, you know. Right, so you there are all these ways sensible. that middle class parents set their kids up um, for success, and um, we're all doing it now. And, uh, and, and part of it is the hoarding of the success, right? Um, part of it is, I mean, you look at these gifted programs in these schools, and if they were truly gifted, there would be a cross-section of black and white kids, and there aren't. Mm -hmm. It's all white kids. So I, you know, I refuse to put my kids in these gifted programs yeah. because I think um, it, it's clearly not about giftedness, <laughs> right? It's, it's about how clearly. to keep the white parents in the exactly, in, in, exactly. In the and there's the hoarding of resources that happens. And but but I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to attribute my success or whatever to luck. Yeah. But that's the truth. Huh. All right. Well, we need to. We need more honest stories. More honest people telling their honest stories. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to announce the number, right? So the number is on there. Do we have a call? Uh, yeah, we have a call. Oof. Uh, let me. Calls are dangerous. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been on C-SPAN where um, they call in and you got to answer the question, and it's like. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've watched a couple of them. Yeah. Was recently where I'm I, was, like, I was talking about the Federal Reserve, and this caller comes in. He's like, can you tell me why there's a Star of David on the Federal Reserve? <laughs> <laughs> there isn't, and that's a crazy question. Yeah. All so. right, let's do it. Hello? You're on. You're on. What's up, how are me? Oh, that's a bullet on the call. No call. Time. Good. <laughs> All right. We'll take one more audience question. Um, yeah. Go microphone. Uh, two, 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 two more audience questions. Yeah. Sorry. Winfield. Okay. Since you're dealing with banks, you've sort of been focusing on, let's say, the role of savings and the role of credit as um, bearing upon the economic opportunity of people. Mm -hmm. But uh, are these really the, the central resources? on which we either have to think about uh, opportunity being based, um, and really are they sufficient in and of themselves? And if you think about mm -hmm. the value of real estate holdings, that is home ownership, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all know that it's only a significant factor in private wealth among those who don't have too much wealth. Mm -hmm. The more wealth one has, the less real estate, one's home ownership figures in that. Mm -hmm. We also know that you know, the accumulated private wealth in the United States is $90 trillion. 94. Okay, 94, which would, be a, which would go up to almost, almost $300,000 per person. Mm -hmm. Yet the, me, the median uh, wealth of a white household is $100,000. Mm -hmm. That of a black household is $1,700, right? There's a big difference. Mm -hmm. But in neither website. case is that wealth in any way sufficient mm -hmm. to be the basis of any kind of economic well-being. So I'm wondering whether the focus on these issues, which obviously have some impact, mm -hmm. are really the key places to look mm -hmm. when we're trying to think what are the primary obstacles mm -hmm. to economic well-being. So what would you have us focus yeah. on? Uh, like, I mean, you yeah, I mean, you're talking about uh, the nature of capitalism. Is capitalism the right way? I mean, I, and I'm not I, talking about capitalism. 
here. What's up? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, what are going to be the, the bases of, of genuine economic livelihood and, and the ability to, up, to exercise one's freedoms, right, in society and the state and to take care of one's family, whether the real bases of this are to be found in such things as the savings or wealth one accumulates, such as in home ownership or in other things, which has nothing to do with eliminating markets. In other words, what you are, one thing you haven't been speaking about at all is income. Income. And jobs. livelihood. Job, yeah. Jobs, yeah. wage levels, the role of employees in uh, what kind of empowerment they have and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. And I'm rather wondering whether the focus on such things as black banks, home loans, and so forth is diverting the issue from things that have perhaps much more primary importance. I, mean, I think if you're operating in capitalism, and if you're, your question is not to confront that, because I, I think that's another conversation. If we're not talking about capitalism versus some other way, if you're talking about capitalism, it's got to be about capital, not income. And this is, you know, Piketty's big uh, uh, insight in capital in the 21st century, but others as well is um, capitalism is about wealth, and capital grows much faster than income can grow. So, so you can talk about income, but income doesn't give wealth. It, uh, you need to start, I mean, you can put, and, and Piketty talks about it, as the capital grows, this is R is greater than G, right? Capital grows at a much faster pace than does income. And so you can talk about, well, can we measure our lives in other ways, like, you know, well-being and, uh, you know, our ability to grow the planet? I mean, we can talk about the ways that capitalism is destructive in and of itself because it focuses on property accumulation and the accumulation of capital, but the point of capitalism is for capital to accrue more unto itself. Uh, and it does so very well. Th that, that is the nature of capitalism. So, so you can say, okay, income, I think, um, is uh, not, not quite as, um, it, it doesn't have the velocity of wealth creation as does capital. Um, and in our country, capital for the middle class has been accumulated through home ownership. Now you can say, well, let's just forget property and capital, and let's come up with some more egalitarian way of spreading resources, taking care of each other, taking care of the environment, because by the way, capitalism will keep growing until it has exploited everything in its path. So, so we can talk about that. Um, that's just a different economic system. And we can talk about that apart from the political system also. We can say we can have a political system that is based in liberty and freedom and also have an economic system that is more egalitarian and spreads wealth and has more community control. Um, I think to say though, I think there are some who say, well, I, I just, I want a world without banks and without credit and without money. And I, and I um, that would be nice, but I think, um, Banks don't have to be a source of exploitation. They have been right. in this in this scenario, but banks could be a source of w spreading wealth. You know, so I don't I don't think I think banks are n neutral in this. You know, I think banks are just the way that they're the engines at the center of the economy. So you can have whatever economy you want. I'm just talking about the engine inside of it, which is the bank, um, and what how we talk about banks and what we allow banks to do with our money. Um, who are bank customers? Today, bank customers are their own selves, like their own enrichment, but they could be the people. I mean, there are, in North Dakota, several cities, North Dakota has a public bank, right? I've talked in my last book about postal banking uh, being a public option for people, right? So this is something that um, I've advocated as a, a, a public way for us to pool our resources and gain wealth and have access that where the, the public coffers would be enriched, right? I am not one who uh, is, um, against the government, you know, Ronald Reagan says the worst thing, you know, you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I think that's baloney, right? it's a, Yeah, it's that's a, it's, baloney. It's, I mean, the government, the depend, I mean, yes, for black people, the government has not been helped, but it, but it, it could be. It could be, and it, it needs, be. To, it be needs be to be if banking is going to be any sort of solution because you can't yeah, have right. a bank without yeah. political control. Yeah, um, and I want to be clear that this book is not about banks. I'm using banks to tell a larger story of wealth and segregation right. and, and wealth inequality. Banks to me are, you, you got to understand banks in order to understand capitalism and you got to understand capitalism if you're going to understand racism. So that, so I use banks as my entry point um, because I think uh, it's very tangible um, right. to study money going in and out of banks. I, I don't care about banks. I'm no like lover of banks. 
No, interesting. I mean, <laughs> what I got from the book, and I, like I said, I think it's a wonderful book, but what I got from the book was the segregation of risk. Yeah. About how instead of actually sharing the burden of post-slavery America, we put all of the volatili- all the volatility onto one community and like exempted mm-hmm. non-blacks from dealing with the problem of the exploitation of blacks. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. that's, that's how we've kind of grown our yeah. economy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and, and the way we talk about risk is the way we talk about social justice too. I mean, risk is about who bears the risk of, um, for example, who bears the risk of your health going down, right? Who bears the risk of poverty in this country, right? And this is a conversation that we're starting to have again. It's it's very central to capitalism is this shifting of risk, right? Who bears the risk of your child dying? Who bears the risk of your funeral costs? And the way that we've talked about risk over time, it used to be that it was a social risk. We all bear the risk of each other's pitfalls. And today it's very personal. Like you prepare for your own losses. And so this healthcare debate is very much about who should bear the risk of one of us, right, dying. And and the way that the, some of the right talk about this, it's like this handout, but that's what insurance is. Insurance, public insurance is we all pool our resources and we pay out when one person uh, has a risk that is more expensive than the rest of us, right? So it is a subsidy, but that's insurance. Insurance is a subsidy that those of us who are healthy pay into for those of us who are sick. And I think people, you know, I hear policymakers talk about it as though that's, I mean, Paul Ryan talking about the healthcare bill is like, well, I don't wanna pay for someone else who's sick, but that's what insurance is, right? And so I think, um, and and I'm happy to do that, right? I, I, you know, because I would hope, I, would, I hope that I'm not the one that gets leukemia and dies next year, and if I get it too, it's not real. No, it's Someone not real. Someone put something in the water. Something in the water, yeah. yeah. I'm not, yeah. I am healthy. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, if I, I hope I'm not the one that gets leukemia, but if it's my neighbor, like, I'm happy that I'm the one paying and not suffering from it, right? Because I know it wasn't their fault. And, and, and that's, I mean, the fundamental premise is I don't think poverty is a moral um, failing. Um, I think poverty is a circumstantial issue, as is wealth. I mean, clearly, <laughs> look at our president, right? I mean, this is a man who um, has done nothing to gain wealth. In fact, they've said that if he was given the amount of wealth that he got and put it in a savings account, he would have been wealthier than he is now. So he squandered the wealth he's been given. So, but he goes around saying, well, I know how to do things. Look at me because I'm, I'm wealthy. That means that I'm more moral or more smart or whatever. And, we, and I think this is the other American myth. And those who are poor just must be doing something wrong. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of people believe that. Yes. And I'm here to say, no, it's not your fault. No, it's not your fault. Black people especially, it's not your fault. Mm-hmm. Um, this government has organized meaningfully for other people at your exploitation. Uh, do I have one more question? Yeah. yeah. We'll take one more. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring the conversation more local since this is about This is you know, Black Athens, yeah. Athens. So 20 years ago in terms of equity in, in across blacks and whites, the answer was always education. Now, especially among politicians and black politicians, the answer is entrepreneurship as the buzzword. And so can you talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned the cultural amnesia around how folks, especially whites, forget that the business that they own was on the backs of their grandfather's grandfather and it wasn't that they just created this business and became multimillionaires and blacks don't have that collective wealth to build off of. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer either from a local government intervention, public-private partnerships, so that if I want to buy my own studio. Right. I need, we need to buy our own studio before <laughs> I get shut down. <laughs> that, 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 that's just how, really, I got, I, got, I, I suspect 10, uh, 10 shows before like something happens. So, um, so the countdown's on. Yeah. So like, what, yeah. what's the answer when we can't fall back on collective wealth? We uh, are dist- distrusting of banks. Uh, our money's in our, our suitcase and our mattress somewhere, but it doesn't add up to a down right. payment. So what's the answer? Yeah, so I want to say one thing. One thing is that this book was not written um, to, to explain to black people how they can grow wealth because, <laughs> because I don't think the burden should fall on the black community. This is a, a, the wealth gap is a thing that we all created and we all are responsible for. I mean, everyone. And so this whole idea that black capitalism and black entrepreneurship, like that's gonna solve the black wealth gap, that's not what created it, right? So what created it is 
a, a policy that benefited white Americans. And so any resolution locally or nationally that just relies on the black community doing stuff is a cop out. That's not that's not how this is going to fix. So one, two, I mean, entrepreneurship is tricky, right? We do have this um, myth of entrepreneurship, but the vast majority of entrepreneurs are poor. The vast majority of small businesses do not make money. Um, and uh, and this is a, a, a truth that, uh, you know, you, we look at when, when you think of entrepreneur, the, who do you think of? Like Steve Jobs or, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Um, not like the ice cream truck guy, but most of them are at, at that scale. Um, so, I mean, you know, education versus entrepreneurship, both, but, but you know, education, like, you got to get your, your hands on um, the, the places of power. Um, and, and this is one of the myths that I also talk, talk about in the book is this idea in black communities and in white communities, but in black communities especially, is we will get economic control and then we will have political control. And what I'm saying is no, the political control comes first. Because unless you have the political control, you're not going to get economic control because economic power comes from uh, political levers. Um, so, yeah. um, you know, however you can get it, and I think education is a really good start. Yeah, I'm a fan of political organizing. I, I think we need mm -hmm. to put better pressure on our, on our political leaders. Black businesses right now have a hard time having capital requirements to actually compete mm -hmm. um, for bids. Yeah. So like, we need the policies that will guarantee the capital requirements so that black businesses can compete. And vo yeah, vote. Vote right. And put, vote. The, pre educate put the pressure on your leaders. Put the yeah. pressure on your leaders. Pressure, yeah. yeah. And don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have a political system and not a system of charity is that we can actually contest and contend politically. Like uh, the the idea, and this is since it, an Athens question. Athens has something like 600 nonprofits. Nonprofits will not take us where we need to go. Mm -hmm. In my estimation, I think we need the quality of politics that'll take us where we need to go. And that means the quality of political pressure, and um, and the quality of citizenry that will, like, actually use that political pressure to get the quality of politics we need. Yeah, I mean, look at like, um, but for Malcolm X, Martin Luther King wouldn't have had that much political sway. Yeah. So like. <laughs> Put the pressure on, like, you know, come up with a radical uh, wing and, yeah. you know, and not to say just to enable moderates, but you ha I mean, don't worry about just going for compromise as your first strike. Yeah, look, as our, as our for, uh, current president said, black people, what do you have to lose? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, we need to actually, let's fight this fight. Let's fight but, it, like, But, but also politically. bring in others. I mean, really uh. bring in... <laughs> <laughs> others don't know how to share power. Like, yeah. like, yeah. like, as soon as they start taking I mean, over, and then they have so much money, there's an imbalance. Yeah. So, yeah. like, you bring in others, but you bring them on their terms until they know their place. It's hard, though. In, <laughs> in a majoritarian... It's about a black, middle class... Like, but in a majoritarian democracy, um, it's hard for minorities to fight um, without the majority at least being persuaded to the cause. And this is a... a I, 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 like, that's an ugly truth, but we do have a, 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 a democracy where... Um, it's majoritarian. Yeah, we don't even talk tough to Nancy Pelosi, though. Like, the black people no, I know. own I know. I know. own the Democratic Party. I know. But, like, we've been told not to ask for anything. I know. So, like, that's a matter of, like, not, treating, not telling the Democrats how to treat us. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Democratic and, Party is not responsive to blacks. No, but we vote for them 95% of the time. So, yeah. like, we can't go Republican, but we can yeah. be a little bit harder on... Yeah. <laughs> we can be harder on the Democrats. Yes, and like and, and pick our own Democrats and, like... And and we should have held Obama accountable. We should hold the Democratic yes, Party accountable. Absolutely. But the fact that we don't means that, like, I think it's a problem with politics. But we don't know how to and ask. run and run for office. Run for office. Run for office and, and 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 get out the vote, even if it's a negative vote. Even if like all the black people in Athens wrote in someone, that is sending a message. Like neither party was meeting our needs, so we got every black person to show up at the polls and write in whatever Cornell West I mean whoever he you know but but that 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 sends a message to people like we will show up and we will vote if you give us, if you vote, give us a candidate yeah. like it's not that we're not going to show up we went to the booth yeah. to send you a message and this is the message we sent you no I, I and, and yeah. there's a book um oh gosh Eddie Glaude, Glaude yeah. who talks about yeah, he wanted in democracy 2016 in black. democracy in black he says a blackout every black person show up and just um, vote uh, either you know a black sort of um, non-vote or a write-in, right. but just to show the voting power and to show that symbols won't do it. 
Yeah. Symbols won't do it. No more symbolic present. We want yep. class-based policies that will build a black middle class. And I need you to explain to me how this is going to build a black middle class and not just make a photo op. Because, um, yeah. first of all, if you like what I'm doing, I'm trying to do political education for Athens. Um, go to thefunkyacademic.com. Sign up for a monthly subscription. Or uh, sign up for a monthly, you know, five, ten dollars whatever, fifty dollars that'd be great. Because we gotta get lights on and you know, I pay rent here and eventually I'm gonna come back to you and we're gonna talk about how to get a hundred thousand dollars to get a studio because this is growing faster than this little space can 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 handle. Um, I'd like to pay Matthew the intern a little bit more. I, I have ideas, people. <laughs> um, uh, so go to thefunkyacademic.com. There's a panel, just kick down a little bit a month that'd be great also if you want to donate just a big month a lot like a lot you can there's a one-time donation button so go ahead and put that if you want to donate the hundred thousand dollars <laughs> paypal doesn't need that cut you just email me <laughs> at email me at irami that's i-r-a-m-i at the funky academic.com that's irami i-r-a-m-i at the funky academic.com and uh, we'll talk about how we get my own studio because, uh, like, depending on the charity of others is uh, a little bit of a, a tenuous proposition when we're actually trying to advocate for something that America has not supported um, in its advocacy, and that is a black middle class. That's a black middle class all over. Um, and if you live in Five Points and you want to donate, we, we'll mark that. We'll mark that. I'll be very happy. Comes. <laughs> we'll know you can put on your uh, on your window. I, I support it. Yeah, I support it. Before I support it. Either. Yes. So um, that'd be really good. And I do want a real studio, a bigger studio, so that we can have more people. And, and this can happen. We can build a black middle class, which will make life better for everybody. Because test scores will go up and when test scores go up your property value go up because it's all tied to poverty and black poverty is all tied to politics yeah. so like let's get this done let's get this done right I want to thank <laughs> Mr. Barato for being here can I say one thing yes, yes. Um, one thing is it's my daughter's birthday Syra oh. and so I just want to say happy birthday Syra happy birthday Syra <laughs> happy birthday Syra, <laughs> birthday, Syra. <laughs> all right so um Thank you for taking the time to be here. We're here every Friday at 4 p.m. Next week is going to be the Union Movement and the South, and why the racist roots of the black, uh, uh, the racist roots of the right to work. It doesn't have to be this way. And honestly, if there's going to be a black middle class, we're going to have to talk about black employees, and we're going to have to talk about unions, and we're going to make that happen. And you're going to get the education for um, f to make that happen, the political education here on this YouTube channel. So send this around, and also remember. Um, you can bet your last honey we're building black middle class money here at the black um, Athenians. Thanks, and we're out. Daddy, my. <laughs>